All right, thank you folks for coming. This is the third installment of this series that Houseman's has kindly organized. I have to say all three have been, I was gonna say surprisingly hot, but we live in new times, so perhaps it is the general ambient norm. But it's very hot. I'm surprised, I was saying to my partner, I don't expect half of you to come. You'd probably have beer or something else elsewhere. But here you are, um, wanting to hear about dystopia and civilizational collapse, <laughs> which I hear is your sub, yeah. yeah. That's the general billing, I think. Uh, <laughs> So uh, just in terms of preliminary introductions, some of you know me, but most of you don't. My name is Sivamon Valluvan. I'm an academic at the University of Warwick. Uh, this is Richard Seymour. I think most of you will be familiar with his work. But in this instance, we are profiling his forthcoming book, uh, Disaster Nationalism. Is this the, the cover that, will, that is likely to come with, Richard? Uh, yeah. yeah. So this is the book, but this is a pre-copy only for dignitary, so only me. Um, but when is it out? Uh, it comes out, I mean, the books will be in the shops uh, by September, but formal publication is the end of October. And of course, in, there's many things I could say about Richard. I'm going to invite Richard to give a little overview of the book. Ordinarily, in the previous installments, I've done the overview, but that will be pretty redundant, seeing as Richard's also here. Um, I should perhaps say it's awfully embarrassing, but I think those of you who know me very well, I, I don't think there's anyone who's influenced my thinking on left, the left impasse and indeed nationalism itself as much as, as, much as Richard, Richard. And um, it's worth saying that I happen to write on mostly nationalism these days, but perhaps from a global arc, a post-colonial arc as well. Um, but it's sometimes, uh, amidst the left, it can sometimes feel like a mildly lonely endeavor uh, uh, in so far as many of my closer peers, quite rightly, I think, and quite understandably, and I too at times, I think we tend to focus on kind of much more pressing formal injustices or formal inequalities and so on and so forth, whilst nationalism tend not, tends not to be given the, 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 the resonant attention, excepting perhaps in British, recent British writing for the honorable mention of Tom Nairn. Um, there hasn't been a kind of, uh, Gilroy obviously, or Paul Gilroy too, um, but there hasn't been, in some ways I think we overlook, certainly in Britain, a kind of nationalism's enduring force, and this, this continues to leave the left in an impasse in so far as as much as it is hard, it's not as straightforward to find the chronic injustice when we talk about in nationalism, but what we fail to understand is precisely this enduring ability to channel collective political desire, and not least to formalize what it means to do collective belonging in formidable ways. And the left, of course, vies for the same terrain, and yet we keep bumping up or we keep encountering this much more formidable claim on our conceptions of political community and, and collective desire. And in that way, I think, in, I have to say it's probably only Richard, I think, oh, let's not say that. Um, there are many other people too, but I think Rich, no thinker has done as much uh, in the left to recognize nationalism as whatever its, uh, its putative merits as the principal hegemonic project orienting a remade global global right. And I think no, no other thing has brought as much light to bear on its distinctive 21st century properties of this reconsolidated force, a force that doesn't invite easy parallels with the interwar era or the romantic era or the modernist era in terms of nationalism's respective heydays. And I think just another quick thing I might say that I think why Richard's work is so important today I think Richard does a lovely thing, which is important for many of us, particularly if you're from a kind of slightly post-colonial orientation. He upsets the conventional political geography of what's afoot. This is decidedly global. Um, I think in the book you will see, you know, you might see England one day, but England is a parochial matter <laughs> compared to India or even Turkey or, or be it even the Philippines, which I think you use as a particular font of formative, embryonic, almost... Uh, uh, something that's lubricating forms of disaster nationalism that we haven't quite grasped uh, in England or Britain itself. And I think in that way, in terms of we hear a lot about the decolonial these days and so on and so forth, but if we're truly thinking from the north or from the south, it's also to understand that Europe no longer is the innovative center of either capital or political reaction or hegemony. And in many instances, the most experimental, dynamic, and perhaps that which the harbinger of the forces to come are often in more instances than not re being rehearsed elsewhere. And I think Richard has done us a great service in trying to still hold Britain and England as a focal point, but not letting our parochial myopias rest too easily in the conveniences of their familiarity. So yeah, on that note, you. Thanks. Can you all hear me? Yeah. All right, so um, 
Before I start, let me just be absolutely clear. I don't have any solutions. <laughs> Please don't pose a question going, you didn't raise any solutions. <laughs> I'm not going to be, um, I'm, not I'm just here to describe a problem and then we can talk about the solutions, all right? Um, so, I want to begin with a real disaster, just to give you an image, something to work with. State of Oregon, summer of 2020, a wildfire bigger than anything in living memory, so far. And if rural Oregonians wanted evidence of a threat to them and their lives, it was raging all around them at temperatures of up to 800 degrees Celsius. The planet is built, as you know, to periodically burn, and whole ecosystems have evolved around that regularity of wildfire, and that's why modern fire management practices don't really work compared to indigenous fire management practices, because indigenous practices aren't based on extirpating the fire, which only makes it worse. Okay, in the Pacific Northwest, there are these, you know, abundance of organic fuels, and they dry out during the summer. And then the hot, dry winds blow in from the east. And then a mere spark can trigger a blaze that will cut through forests and brush with teeth of flame meters long. And the intensity of these blazes has been increasing over the last three decades because something, something, climate change. In September 2020, the wildfire swept over the Cascade mountain ridge in the west of Oregon, was driven up the slopes blanketed with fuel-rich pine forests and bears and goats and coyotes and marmots, and was oxygenated and pushed over the Cordillera Chines by hurricane-strength Pacific winds until it rolled across the rural plains and forests like lava. The winds blew wildfires into megafires and downed power lines to create more fires, and it was surreal. It was a traumatizing experience. 10% of the state's population was forced to evacuate. Thousands of homes were destroyed. 33 people actually killed in the blaze. And this acute disaster came hard upon a series of chronic disasters. Economic depression following the financial crash in 2008, soaring poverty rates, joblessness in rural areas, suicide rates soaring, pervasive alcoholism, the second highest addiction rates in the United States before the fentanyl crisis took off. We often hear that disasters bring people together. It's a nice idea, and uh, Rebecca Solnit has written about this, disaster communities. As the crisis disrupts your ordinary suffering, misery, and alienation, and inflames utopian desires, people come together, but it ain't necessarily so. That only happens where the disaster doesn't disperse the community or exacerbate existing fault lines, like racial ethnic fault lines, for example, and where there are already traditions of mutualism and self-help. Kai Erickson, whose work I commend to you, uh, specializes in disasters, found not a single example of the famous democracy of distress or city of comrades in any of the disasters that he studied. Um, most pertinently, I recommend his book on the uh, Buffalo um, uh, crisis, Buffalo Creek crisis in West Virginia, 1972. I won't go into it because we don't have time. But anyway, he found instead that the acute disaster frequently compounds long-brewing chronic disasters. Insidiously, the chronic disasters creep around and shut down a person's defences without them noticing. They've reconciled themselves to the poverty, to the suicides, to the alcoholism, to everything else that's going on. And so, when the acute disaster comes, they experience something akin to, in his phrase, a psychological concussion. concussion. They experience a dull silence. They retreat to the survivalist enclaves of life. Lucy Easthope, um, who is um, a disaster response specialist, refers to the experience of hiraith, which is a Wel Welsh word meaning longing for a place to which there is no return. And then there's the hopelessness. There's a survivor of Buffalo Creek uh, disaster that I just mentioned. She told Ericsson, she said, I believe there will be wars and there will be a bomb-like thing that will just destroy this place to pieces. Somebody, some fool is going to blow it all up to pieces. Sure as I'm sitting here and you're sitting there, it'll happen. This doomerism is absolutely commonplace among uh, survivors of disaster. Now given this, the catastrophilia of the far right is something of a puzzle. Because they can't stop fantasizing about imaginary disasters, great replacement, white genocide, love jihad, 
uh, in India. FEMA death camps, bathroom predators, gender ideology. And in Oregon, this took the form of a spontaneous mass apocalyptic fantasy spread through social industry networks because there's scant local news there. That's another chronic uh, disaster. Um, spread primarily through local, new, uh, local social industry networks and then echoed by figures in authority from local police to Donald Trump. Since 2017, white conservatives have been hearing from various sources, especially uh, entertaining YouTube accounts, that this seditious group called Antifa um, was planning a massacre of white conservative Christians. These rumors were part of the original brew that produced QAnon, and in 2020, these white conservative Christians in rural Oregon looked at the COVID lockdown and they said, this is the tyranny we've been warning about. And they looked at Black Lives Matter and they said, this is the sedition that we've been warning about. They're burning the cities. They're coming for us. And so the rumor spreads that Antifa is the cause of the fires. It's just too weird. How else do you explain it? Somebody is doing something to us. The fires are caused by terrorists and paid mercenaries of the Democratic Party. Vigilantes then set up armed checkpoints. Some people refuse to evacuate. A man who's told to flee for his life is given a level three evacuation order. That means get out now, you're going to die. He says, I'm protecting my city. If I see people doing crap, I'm going to hurt them. Okay. Now, that wasn't the psychological concussion that other victims experienced as they fled, many of whom, years later, when you read their accounts, still can't sleep without dreaming about it. This was exciting. Uh, it reminds me of Michael Billig's work on British fascists. I don't know if you know this guy. He's uh, very interesting on nationalism. He interviewed, he did social psychological work on British fascists uh, in the 70s. He interviewed National Front members and, you know, found these were basically mostly psychologically quite normal compared to other people, but they were addicted to being threatened. I just want to be threatened once because then I can hit back. I can't shoot climate change or capitalism. These are abstractions, but I can shoot Antifa. And then I can take my guns to the streets and I can shoot Black Lives Matter. And then I can get to the capital and I can shoot the communists who run the government. Now this is obviously a misprision, that you're a false concreteness, because the target of my bullets will always be a phobic object. Antifa, cultural Marxists, Muslim terrorists, globalist Jews, social justice warriors. It'll be an abstraction that I happen to have been able to attach to a person that I can kill. It solves nothing because like any symptom, it exists to avert solutions. It is part of an addictive cycle of threat and release, of ontological security challenged and then secured by the destruction of a neighbor. Disaster nationalism as an alternative to depression, to the depression born of the involution of liberal civilization, of the incapacity of liberal capitalism to give us what we most deeply need is much more effective than CBT or happy pills. It says those demons in your head are real and you can kill them. Now in my book, which you can't read now, you're not allowed, <laughs> my book charts the rise of disaster nationalism from peak liberalism, the endlessly mythopoeticized 1990s, from the moment when Hindu nationalists demolished the Babri Masjid in Ayodhya, uh, Pat Buchanan made a breakthrough for the nativist right in the Republican primaries. The European far right started to rack up significant votes through the hardening of the state induced by the war on terror, during which, as you'll recall, some of you won't recall, you're all shockingly young, but um, as, as those of you who are um, as elderly as I am will recall, um, the, the war on terror normalized torture, kidnapping, civilizational combat, renewed ethnic repressions, Islamophobic crackdowns, all of that was normalized. And in the context of that also, you had the consolidation of ethno-nationalist alliances globally, from Narendra Modi's pogrom in Gujarat to Ariel Sharon's flattening of the West Bank. It was all part of the war on terror. And then the concomitant expansion of far-right success across Europe in that context. Then the hardening of civil society by austerity in which the undeserving poor are relentlessly monstered and scapegoated, and the contiguous rise of militias and anomic lone wolf fascism and various cyber fascism amid all this decomposition. The real breakthroughs beginning with Narendra Modi's victory in 2014, not, you know, Brexit or something. Brexit was a regional, provincial thing. It our own local misfortune, really. Um, uh, by the way, um, just so I'm clear, I'm not going to be uh, participating in any 
EU romance either. Um, so anyway, um, Narendra Modi's breakthrough in 2014, widely celebrated by the business press, especially in America, his pogromist past completely forgotten by Obama and Downing Street, then Trump's victory, Duterte's win on a pledge to murder millions of drug addicts, mm. exuberant about it. We're going to murder millions of, actually, you know what? If you don't have a job, I'll give you one. Go out and murder a drug addict. Drug addict. That's what he said. It's, it should be funny, but it's not. That's the general historical tendency for the rate of hilarity to decline <laughs> as things become real. <sighs> and then Bolsonaro's victory after a soft coup against the Workers' Party and so on. And what I say is this. First of all, it isn't the economy, stupid. Mm. Attempts to analyze the new far right, this inchoate global fascism in terms of a displaced expression of material interests construed as concern for jobs and wages and whatever else, miss the mark. People repeatedly vote against so-called bread and butter issues mm. if there's a chance for a symbolic win. The idea of enlightened self-interest, which we've inherited from classical political economy, never described how people really behaved. It described how people ought to be governed by pitting avaricious passions, self-interest, against subversive passions. I say we need to return to the theory of the passions, not bourgeois interest, and particularly to look at the role that persecutory and vengeful passions in the context of relentless social comparisons and the extolment of winners, like Donald Trump, so much winning. Where did he come from? The Apprentice. You know, they loved him, the media. The extolment of winners and sadism towards the losers. And all of that plays a, a, an important role in people's sense of well-being. So you want a redistribution of humiliation and punishment. Second, susceptibility to far-right disinfotainment is not about a lack of media literacy. Like if you just get your elderly relatives to like learn how to distinguish between truth and uh, reality, they'll stop believing that water can cause cancer or whatever the fuck. Um, it's actually about a collapse of social trust. To talk about media literacy implies that there's too much trust. You know, they trust whatever they see, you know. Actually, it's the collapse in social trust discernible across a variety of industries, look, I indices. If we can't trust, we can't know. This is a scientific fact. Most uh, scientific experiments and research these days require people from different specializations to trust one another. And they require us to trust, trust them. Humans as a species depend on cumulative learning. Most of what we know, we know because we trust others, especially those with some sort of authority. Doctors and whatnot. The experts who Michael Gove said have made us sick. The crisis of authority engenders a crisis of trust in a neoliberal and increasingly now post-neoliberal context in which the dominant political wisdom has been that every appeal to the public interest or to social well-being is a disguise for self-interest and that everyone else is a competitor and a risk to be managed. They're all out to get you. In that situation, people embark on DIY knowledge construction, deriving counter theories based on a symptomatic reading of the contradictions and omissions of the mainstream news. These politically ambiguous uh, alt conspiracist cultures of the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, which I well remember sort of were hovering around the left, mm. um, and sort of had some connection to the kind of uh, alt alien cultures, which were kind of also ambiguous because they implied an opening to the other, but that's not where it went. Um, they were all sort of all too readily appropriated by a new far right from QAnon to Querdenkin. Mm -hmm. And importantly, this disinfotainment, as I'm calling it, it's really, it's not just about misleading people for electoral advantage or for grift or whatever. That's, the, that's part of it. But fundamentally, it is cyber war. The point is to activate wayward, vengeful passions against well-selected enemies to destroy their reputations, to destroy their careers, and even to cause them to be attacked and killed. Modi reward follows his favorite trolls, and his team has target lists of enemies to be fed to the trolls. And sometimes those enemies are killed. Bolsonaro run an office of hate, Duterte organized rhythmic convulsions of panic over drug crime, and mass distributed campaigns of sexual harassment and death threats against opponents, frequently before jailing them or having them murdered. Third, the erotic miseries and fantasies of the far right. They're baroque scenarios of extreme sexual evil, global child trafficking run by Democrats Hollywood and a crypto communist elite and apparently a furniture st store. Um, Romeo jihads by Muslim subversives in India intended to destroy the Hindu fabric of the nation. 
bathroom predators, gender ideology out to brainwash children and destroy traditional masculinity, the Chads and Stacys and Tyrones with their sexual tyranny over lonely, sexually isolated males, are not, these fantasies are not simply and straightforwardly conservative. Mm. They contain a brutally transgressive edge, as in those MRA fora, which if you read them, they revel in rape and paedophilia. As in Andrew Tate fandom, what's Andrew Tate say? He says, oh, I'm not a rap rapist, but I moved to Romania because there you can rape and I like to be free. Free to what then? Um, as in the literal erotic lionization of Modi and Trump by their supporters as symbols of brutal, incipiently fascistic power. It's not about whether there is rape, because in their bleak purview, someone always gets raped. It's who? As a female Hindu activist explained, in reference to the bloody ecstasies during the Gujarat pogrom, which I don't even have uh, the words or time to describe to you, um, she said, they have raped so many of us, now we must rape some of them. This kind of decivilizing two-step, you know, selective permissiveness for some and repression for others, um, is actually consistent consonant with fascist history in which the brutally transgressive carousing of na Nazi soldiers was encouraged while those excluded from the nation were sterilized, while interracial marriages were banned, etc. And this sexual politics is impossible to disentangle from the hallucinatory anti-communism of the moment where every milquetoast centrist or fluffy purveyor of woke doxa is, uh, you know, apparently part of the communist conspiracy. Fascist anti-communism from the Third Reich to Franco Spain never really engaged with communism as it actually existed. So anti-communism has always been hallucinatory. It was always, among other things, a figure for an existential racial and sexual challenge. Red women hiding guns up their skirts, communist women castrating men, Jewish communists seducing Christian girls, Communism, fascists think, brutalizes, rapes, and assaults the wrong people. Disaster nationalism seeks what it sees as a redistribution of violation and humiliation. Someone else has to feel what I'm going through. Fourth, and this is really important, disorganized public violence by lone wolves, vigilantes, militias, paramilitaries, and others is not an electoral disadvantage for the new far right. It is a unique selling point and it synergizes with top-down status strategies of violence. The Gujarat pogrom raised the vote for the BJP, which, having been in trouble after it, uh, you know, catastrophic mishandling of a real disaster, which was an earthquake the previous year, was restored to its fortunes by orchestrating a mass, brutally violent response to an alleged disaster, a supposed Muslim attack on Hindu worshippers on a train. During the 2020 presidential election, the Republican Party was electrified by grassroots vigilantism against lockdown and then against Black Lives Matter. And they made Kyle Rittenhouse their patron saint, even as Trump was dispatching federal militias to kidnap protesters and ordering police violence against them. In the Brazilian election that saw Bolsonaro actually thrown out, he had gone from being 20 points behind to nearly winning during a campaign in which he once again called for leftists to be machine gunned and in which his supporters repeatedly threatened, attacked and murdered dozens of Workers' Party supporters. Um, Modi's henchmen stifled mass protests against the Citizenship Amendment Act, which uh, made religion a condition for citizenship in India for the first time, by orchestrating yet another bloody pogrom in Delhi, where Muslims were dragged from their homes, beaten to death and then set on fire in the gutter with the help of the police. Duterte's death squad populism was wildly popular, keeping his approval ratings close to 90%, whatever else he did, however badly he performed, despite the fact that a majority of people polled feared that they or someone they knew would be killed by his anti-drug death squads. It might kill someone I know, but I'm bloody glad they're there. We are beyond enlightened self-interest at this point. I hope I've made that clear. The critical point, the dangerous point, is when there is a dialectic of mutual radicalization between the violent base and the violent state. When the actions of the armed grassroots are celebrated and justified and protected by the political leadership, who then take it as an opportunity to accelerate their own repressive policies to expand their violence, thus encouraging the base even further. 
And all of this bears on the political economy of the new far right, for they don't even pretend to offer what Michael Mann called class transcendence, which, you know, interwar fascism pretends, you know, we're, we're anti-capitalists, we're going to, you know, it wasn't really about abolishing class, but changing its spiritual meaning, nationalizing it. But they had a utopian imaginary too. They don't even pretend to have that. They accept fully, I mean, they fully internalize neoliberal precepts. They accept muscular national capitalism, capitalism without the woke constraints, without health and safety, without welfare except for certain national protections. And where that clearly does not deliver for the majority whose living standards go down, the redistribution of humiliation and violence once again does. The telos of this process is genocide. And we see a version of this playing out in Israel, in Gaza, and in the West Bank. There, an army of mostly 20-something men with an additional influx of reservists of older years, radicalized for years despite a relatively low level of conflict, embracing the most violently supremacist and elim eliminationist politics, not only revel in their war crimes, flaunting their murders, flaunting the theft of Palestinian property, posing in the stolen underwear of Palestinian women, posting these jaunty joking videos about on the internet where the joke is, ha ha, all the Palestinians are dead. Ha ha, there are no children in this school. Ha ha ha, there are no children in this playground anymore because this playground is a smoking heap of rubble. They're the ones posting these joking videos to the internet, posting the pictures of themselves doing their war crimes to dating sites. Think again about the libidinal economy of the far right. And they're the ones also sniping children, running tanks over handcuffed doctors and bombing schools and all the rest of the atrocities that you've been hearing about for almost a year now. And they push to go further. They want more. They record themselves saying that if the military leadership withdraws from Gaza, they will turn their guns on their own leaders. Meanwhile, in Israel, any remaining leftist, and there hardly any, are any leftists left in Israel, who mildly opposes the war on humanitarian grounds, not even political grounds, is hunted by far-right mobs, forced into hiding, or flung into jail in solitary confinement. There is the opportunity that they, the Israeli far-right, have been waiting for for a long, long time. The forlorn hope of ending their misery by killing the traitors and destroying a neighbor. And all of this is enabled and has been enabled by that curious symbi symbiosis between the neoliberal hard center flirting with racist authoritarianism and the racist far-right that has internalized so many neoliberal precepts. Two parties who thrive in different ways on cultivating hopelessness and vengeful affects among the people, pseudo-pessimism. And this is what it is to live in a dying civilization. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> well, as ever, a lot to cover, but a miserable, a miserable list register. Um, I think that you say a lot about the psychic life of today's nationalism, but I want to push that because I think most of us were in Hausmann, so we are, for, we are confessed leftists, so we're to make, that's the cross we have to bear. Um, so I, and of course, we come in with certain intuitions and we are accustomed to saying, oh yeah, economism is not, you know, it shouldn't be overstated. We are accustomed ourselves to preempt that, oh, we don't want to do re reductive analysis. But I just want to push you further because I couldn't agree more, but um, I want to think through the implications for those of us on the left when we when we uh, subscribe to this important corrective. Namely, obviously, even in Brexit, I've said this before, but even during Brexit, um, the Romaniacs, Ramonas, or whatever, I think Farage has a new coinage for them, but I forget, the re re rejoiners, um, whatever slur you prefer, the Romaniacs um, obviously went to town on the 350 million on the bus. And they yeah. thought, well, this was the great subterfuge. This was the great ruse. And don't you realize that this was, it was the signs on the bus that misled the otherwise great British public. Yeah. Uh, clearly, it wasn't about the bus. I mean, whatever you want to think about people, people aren't that stupid. People weren't po po voting for a passing sign on the bus. Or no one, I think, credibly believed that 350 million a week was kind of suddenly going to show up in the, uh, in the um, NHS coffers. So there is something that is well beyond material. You call it subversive pleasures, I suppose, or subversive interests, uh, as opposed to enlightened self-interest. But then what are the implications for us, I think? Because uh, I like to think 
there is some of our impulses is still to name the relative privilege of those who might chase after the nationalist overtures. We talk about relative decline. We talk about stagnation. We talk about, oh, there might be property owners in the provinces still. I happen to think that's a completely misplaced argument because property in Stoke isn't property in Hampstead. And uh, kind of the, the, the leftist bubble might misconflate what it entails to sit on in, in property in those terms. Um, and for me, anyways, this, this is clearly a national, everywhere, perhaps not in China, but otherwise most nationalisms as we encounter do not promise betterment, certainly not material betterment, but seem to have a certain hagiography or stagecraft across uh, about victimhood uh, and righteous, authentic victimhood, the suffering subject, the perversities of suffering as enjoyment, uh, the persecutory, the persecutory dignity that we, you all claim you are persecuted, but we're the only real ones who are being persecuted. Mm -hmm. and, they're, they're, and it's, of course, nationhood or claim to a reconsolidated nationhood that helps uh, 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 map out who is the authentic subject. But in that case, what are the implications of, I don't know if you do, I, I do sometimes, we do talk about privilege now and then, you know, about yeah. how do we escape that trap? Because insofar as, in my own circles, it's so clear trying to name someone having it worse isn't going to get us, anymore, uh, get us anywhere any more. Um, they too think they're victims for better or for worse. And how do we therein, I, don't, I, I know we're not talking about solutions, but at least correctives, or, or how do we cleanse the terrain in those terms that we understand that there is almost an appeal to them understanding themselves as victims and the psychic life of that victimhood. Well, I mean, there's a couple of things there. First of all, people... Millions of people have their lives wrecked by capitalism all the time without becoming fascist. Um, and the question is, why? Um, as it happens, the people at the bottom of the heap, as it were, um, those who are struggling, really struggling, um, are the least susceptible to the far right's message. Um, and it's worth thinking about why that is, because, I mean, I would have s sort of taken it as obvious that if you're in a trade union, mm you'll be somewhat inoculated because you get to experience a sense of your sort of personal and collective power mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Um, and uh, that gives you um, real wins as opposed to these symbolic wins. Um, but I think that um, just because you are um, put upon and victimized mm -hmm. doesn't mean necessarily that you want to victimize other people. I think it's only when what's really at stake is that you're at risk of being plunged into the struggling mass of humanity, which you've somewhat dis differentiated yourself from, even if only a little bit. Mm. So for example, uh, the, the sort of move towards um, far-right politics among some trade unionists in parts of Europe is often based upon the fact that um, the unions aren't actually very useful. Mm. They're kind of business unions. And the internal culture of the workplace hasn't really resisted uh, flexibilization, casualization, temporary work, and so on. And so those workers who have full-time status and get a reasonable pay with reasonable benefits, whatever that means today, tend to see themselves as participating in an island of wealth, of affluence, mm -hmm. that has to and identify with their bosses in this respect, and has to be protected from outsiders who are coming in, and the sponges and welfare queens and all the rest of it. Okay, so that's a part of it. But also, if you look at these um, capital rioters, the pseudo-insurrectionists, um, these people, um, when there was studies done of who they were, it turned out that most of them were like downwardly mobile business people. Mm -hmm. You know, like there were a few sort of um, people who had experience in militias and some who had been in the army and so on. But quite a lot of them had been doing extremely well. Like they named some of the uh, big players and they had been running businesses that until 2008, they were making a fortune. And then since then they'd been going downhill. And uh, the psychology of, of it is almost too obvious. Um, now you ask the question, okay, well, what does that mean for us? Um, in the last chapter um, of Disaster Nationalism, where I very grudgingly <laughs> deign to offer some sort of hope or optimism or whatever, um, I sort of raise the question of whether it's enough to offer people bread and butter politics, because mm. that's the kind of Jacobin social democratic answer. You know, people uh, really just need, um, you know, they need gas and water run for free by the government, uh, you know, maybe nuclear power or something like that. Um, but, you know, the, address their material needs, 
which is an interesting thing. Let's we'll park that. But material uh, is a put, should be put in quotes there. Address their material needs, and then you know they'll forget about all this uh, you know stuff about identities and you know all that the, the superfluous ideological steam. Um, first of all, I say material needs are good. Bread and butter is good. We like bread and butter, but we don't love it. You know, you love your kids. You love your kids not because they increase your amount of free time and energy and money, or your time with friends. You love your kids, weirdly, because you sacrifice for them. Strange that, isn't it? We like to sacrifice, we enjoy it. Um, I, I don't have kids, I have a cat. <laughs> Fucking hate my cat. But I also love her, even though she scratches and bullies me. Um, that's a side point. But the point is, the things, the, 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 the eros of a society, the capacity of that society to sustain relations of mutual love, um, have to be built. They have to be worked on. And so, you know, when you get people wheeling out these tired, clapped out slogans about organizing and so on, that's where it comes from. Yeah. It's not, you know, uh, I mean, organizing just sounds so vapid. But I'll tell you, like, something I started doing recently, I started um, uh, uh, volunteering down the church, right? Why? Because, not because, like, you know, um, or not only because I wanted that nice virtuous feeling at the end of it, but because um, you can walk about this city and you'll regularly encounter people who need a bit of money or help or something. Um, and the, you know, like most, most of the time, the tempting thing is just to walk straight past because I'm too busy and, you know, I don't have any change. I'm not going to a bank machine to get you 20 quid to come back here. But actually what I started doing, just look, this is an idea, all right? Just think about this. You ever heard of charity trolling? Okay, that's just because I invented it, but basically, <laughs> Um, it's not really trolling, but basically the idea is, it occurred to me, like, what would it be like if you saw somebody begging for money and you went and you got a, a massive wad of money and just gave it to them, have a look on, see the look on their face? <laughs> um, and it's actually, um, so, um, you know, like, because, and it's, you're really giving them the money, but it's the surprise and delight mm -hmm. and joy. Mm -hmm. Those uh, encounters are really good. Mm -hmm. Now I thought, okay, great, fine. Um, so occasionally I would do something like that and uh, like, you know, say, how many, how much is like five copies of the big issue, mm. you know? Um, and then they say, I don't have five. I don't want the money. I don't want the big issue. Just take the money. Mm. The point is I wanted something to experience something like that much on a much more regular basis. And I wanted um, uh, to see what it was like when people actually lived as if uh, relations of mutual love were Manifest. real. Mm. Um, and actually, you, you know, you go to these places and um, you're not just giving a bit of money, you're giving something of yourself, number one. Uh, number two, everybody else is doing the same thing. And the rule in this church particularly, the rule is unconditional love for whoever walks in the door. Yeah. Now, uh, if that isn't a threat to capitalism, yeah. I, mean, I, it, I mean, obviously these are nice churchy people, they're not going to threaten anything, but the point is uh, that, uh, that, you know, th this is not the norm in everyday life in this country. But, you know, I've experienced enough of the dregs of left-wing organization and cooperativism and uni trade unionism and so on, that I've seen elements of that there too. Yeah. I've seen, you know, like when you're out of money, somebody, you know, you're a left-wing party and you're out of money, somebody's going to give you some money, you know. If you need help uh, with your house because you just got evicted, they're going to help you out. Um, and that is solidarity. Yeah. So how do we... I'm sorry I've sort of digressed and rambled so much, but the question is how do we, um, uh, you know, uh, develop the opportunity for people to experience their power mm -hmm. in a way that um, isn't about the power to put your foot in someone's neck? Um, so I think... I think, you know, we've gone through a phase where people experimented with horizontalism, you know, mutualism and all the rest of it. Fine, but it's unreliable. Um, it, it doesn't generate sufficient institutional um, legacies to sustain itself. Uh, we've gone through a phase of trying to take over the Labour Party. I mean, that, that went the way it went. Um, because the Labour Party couldn't be transformed. I mean, I think possibly, you know, it could have been handled better, but the point is that experiment is now done. So I think the, you know, uh, concretely in this situation, I would like to know 
like what are we doing with all those hundreds of thousands of Corbynistas and whatnot who were a member of a party and are no longer a member of a party and haven't really changed how they think and feel about things and everything in their lives is organized to incentivize them to um, compete, to ignore other people, to engage in what Norman Garris called a contract of mutual indifference. Mm -hmm. Um, I would like to start by, you know, um, uh, thinking about how to construct a party. And I think that's a real problem now. Um, and then, you know, I would like to get to the point of all power to the Soviets. But what comes in between these two points? I don't know. No, no amazing. I think I, actually later on maybe we can revisit. I mean, it's something I write about a lot to, to no avail because I think people prefer it when I write about stockpiling the horrors. But in the same idiom, I always try to, not merely as a gesture, but as a genuine commitment of how life is rendered bearable for most of us half the time. That there is enough in our everyday registers that are indeed structural. They don't, they're not non-structural, that they, they too are structural and produce enchanting structures of generosity and mutual recognition that surely is the incubating node for any other society that we envisage. On that note, I'm writing a book on pubs, would you believe? Um, <laughs> I should plug that. We're only three chapters in and we don't have an agent and we don't have a publisher, but so, something, so it should come to avail at some point. Um, I want to rewind a little bit about um, what I think, you didn't use the term, but essentially you're suggesting, I think many have rightly identified that there's something quite petty bourgeois about the nationalist formation. That is to say, we might not say they're just business owners or small business yeah, owners, yeah. Not, sometimes not even that petty, but nonetheless, we're talking about private sector employees who might be experiencing some kind of, or self-employed and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, in the book, and I think all of us on the left struggle with this, there is nevertheless in this reconsolidated nationalism a strong workerist idiom, uh, a proletariat posture. Now, you rightly call it a task that obviously it doesn't amount to much, and even Trump or his, uh, his uh, equivalents elsewhere, when asked to support striking industrial workers at a yeah. fraud plant, yeah. are inc incredibly reluctant. But nonetheless, the idiom does a lot of work. Uh, it certainly, at the very least, socializes and culturalizes the question of class. Absolutely. And leaves us all astray. Because inevitably, <laughs> some of us are veering close to what they would like to harangue as the PMC or, or whatever it may be. Um, that the worker, as his authentic iteration, as a culturalized, as a symbolic spectacle, is nationalist, yeah. is socially conservative, is provincial. Yeah. And X number of kind of winning dichotomies materialize. So I know, and if we follow through with your earlier argument, it's not that they offer anything, but they do claim the worker nonetheless in their sweep. Yeah. Um, and I'm just thinking, because you were saying they're not actually challenging capitalism, I agree. And I think there's something about the interwar fascist formation that does not want to conquer capitalism, but tries to render it subordinate to the integrity of the nation. Right. right? Um, so I appreciate that, but. I know J.D. Vance is having a tough time, uh, <laughs> but... Not as tough as his couch. <laughs> <laughs> but, he, but, but he previews something, uh, at least in the American register. Um, th there is something about these fellows who are uh, much more pointedly post-liberal, are happy to rattle some protectionist fanfare, d muscular national capital, but not just merely as entrepreneurial winners in a free market, but something about the state shall sponsor winners, yeah. or at least... Sub and then the kind of modeling of China lurks, I think, in the unsaid distance. 100%. So, I don't know. I don't have a question, actually. But <laughs> well, I can <laughs> comment on that. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, the one thing I would just like to say in response to all that is uh, that I think the, the fact that I carefully rooted around China uh, is a bit of a weakness in the book. I, I, thought, I didn't think it was a weakness, but I, it was conspicuous. Uh, well, the thing is, uh, I think China is... Uh, sui generis. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, I don't believe that it's any kind of socialism or whatever, but it's a different kind of uh, challenge, even though it has also uh, sort of engaged in a kind of nationalist um, and uh, repressive exclusionary politics. But I, I, I'll leave that to one side. Um, look, in terms of, um, you know, what they offer to the working class and so on, um, I think interwar fascism, you're right, sought to subordinate capitalism to the authority of the nation. Um, I don't think that's what disaster nationalists are out to do at the moment. I don't think they see a contradiction. Mm. And in fact, uh, you know, like, it's only in the global north that the far right really is even challenging the institutions of globalization. You know, like, uh, why? Because it's a relative decline. Mm. 
Trump is attacking you know, NAFTA and the WTO and all the rest of it. Um, N Modi isn't. Mm. Duterte actually openly attacked protectionism. Mm. So uh, they're part of um, an ascendant, um, or uh, like I, I would like to say, probably um, s s sort of thwarted in ascendants. There's something they feel is holding them back. And obviously, China is actually both the threat and the model. Yeah, yeah. It's like, well, why aren't we as muscular as China? Exactly. So there is that. But there's something else. Duterte's death squad populism was overtly sold as economic uplift. Mm. How? How, did that, how is that supposed to work? Because in um, his hometown, Davao, um, where he was re-elected with like 90-something percent of the vote, they loved him, um, he had done the same thing. You know, he'd organized death squads, often with the cooperation of the Communist Party, by the way, Communist Party militants. He got them involved. Mm which tells you something about the Philippine Communist Party. These, these people joined the first Duterte administration, then were driven out, and then were red-tagged, and their members were witch-hunted and all. Fucking walk straight into the gin trap of your own making. Anyway, um, but the, the, the idea was, um, he's going to go out on television and call out corruption every other week. He's going to have the corrupt people killed, call, have the criminals killed. Once you have secure, security in the streets, the businesses will come, the investment will come. Mm. And that's what he took nationwide. So we're going to raise the living standard of the working majority, you know, the, the, the people in, poor, uh, in poverty who are actually probably a majority in the Philippines, you know, it's like um, by destroying the morally corrupt parts of the working class, namely those on drugs. Um, okay, so that was, the, that was the promise. Now then, how is that supposed to work? That works because the nation has been reconstrued as a bundle of resources. That's, um, there's a great book about Indian nationalism, I think it's uh, called Brand New Nation. Ravindakor. Right, yeah, yeah. which talks about how, uh, you know, post, say in, in, in the 1990s when India was neoliberalizing uh, and they were abandoning the sort of post-war, well, what remained of the post-war welfare state and all the, all the rest of it. Um, they started to reconfigure the nation as basically a bundle of resources that can be offered up to investors nationwide who are just assumed to be, I mean, investors are uh, sort of an abstraction, but they're assumed to be like sort of demigods floating around the world waiting for places to invest in. Um, and the nation is reconfigured as a bundle of resources to be invested in. Um, and once you have it like that, um, as Cor points out, that actually works quite well you know, synergizes quite well with hypernationalism. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it basically allows you to um, co configure the problem within the nation as uh, morally decadent elements causing capitalist decline. So you don't really ever have to com com even no. confront the problem of capital. Um, uh, you know, except to say, as Donald Trump would say, you know, well, capitalism hasn't been working very well of late, except when he was in office, in which case, best growth ever, most people employed ever, best, you know, everything was the best. Um, so, um, yes, th there's, there's a sense in which um, they recognize, intuitively, I think, I don't think they have a sophisticated political economy or anything like that, um, uh, I think they recognize intuitively that uh, what some would call recognition um, is an integral part of any economy. Um, and that recognition is bound up with um, the distribution of rewards and incentives. Mm -hmm. And that it isn't actually, you know, like historically we on the left would have said, well, you know, if you're, if you're told that you're respected and you're recognized and they, you know, like uh, all the rest of it, but you get bottom wages and they treat you like shit, then you're not really recognized and people won't accept that. But I think they found ways to offer people forms of um, compensatory recognition. Yeah. Like, you know, this whole idea that uh, the Tories were going to level up, you know, the Boris Johnson and all the rest of them were going to level up. They weren't really offering very much. They were basically offering a version of, um, you know, we're going to let um, status sectors of capital have a whole bunch of money to, um, and, you know, nepotistic sectors and to build in these areas. But there's going to be growth. There's going to be jobs. 
um, you're going to get railways and, you know, roads and all the rest of it. The potholes are going to be filled because, you know, obviously in small towns, all they care about is potholes. Um, and uh, we, um, you know, basically out of the process, the only real beneficiaries in the, in the long run will be uh, the sectors of capital that uh, orchestrate it and coordinate it. But... It's 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 better than nothing, and the attention you know, like these dying towns where people yeah, yeah. are fleeing from. It's better than nothing. No, I, I think Johnsonianism. I mean, obviously, it's briefly lived, but I do think he hinted at something akin to a, yeah. a nationalist parlaying of right Keynesianism, or it certainly wasn't as austerian, or didn't. It might have been by stealth, but wasn't uh, vocally moralizing about the moral authority of austerity uh, and the market nor or market morality. Um, I just want to segue a little bit because there is a, a, a note, quite a few notes of, of, of optimism, but you are, it would be indecorous of you to call it optimism. Um, but you know, there is something about nationalism, and I think this nationalism, but all nationalism, so I, w I am prone to saying that nationalism is always abstract. That is to say, it's in some senses the most concrete political force. I, it organizes sovereignty in the modern world. But it is never there. You can't see it. You can't catch it. You can't name it. People don't wake up, think about it. They, tend, they claim they care, but then they have dinner and talk about something completely different. Yeah. That it is an extremely elusive force. And you suggest that in the contemporary disaster nationalism, it has a remarkably thin social base. Yeah. That its political muscle and uh, uh, ascendancy far outstrips, far exceeds its actual socialization into civic institutions and the interpolation of subjectification. As a, as a result, India, as you rightly say, and I think China, it, is quite the exception here. Uh, Hindutva is greatly aided by the civic society yeah. structures of RSS that does really micro-granular socialization from, from a very early stage. Um, but so if nationalism lacks that depth, those kind of previous, of previous modernist iterations at least, um, mm -hmm. and I just want to segue because I want to make allusion to one of your other books, Twittering Machine, but you also talk about it today, about the, the YouTube culture or the paranoiac, uh, a compulsive addiction of the nighttime shimmer and rage and resentment. Um, it doesn't matter that it's so thin insofar as sh should we on the left try to work thinness with the thickness of everyday social life and socialization, or is it another kind of virality that we must contend with? That there is something that, whilst this nationalism works only as kind of swarms, hence why it's also extremely promiscuous. Yeah. Kwendenko is a great uh, example of that. It sh people should sometimes pause. Why would a Trumpist or an arc reactionary nationalist care about COVID vaccines the next day? Mm -hmm. And why would they care about wellness and pharmaceutical skullduggery the next day? And why would they care about transgender or, or toilet hysterias or whatnot the next day. There's something extremely promiscuous that suggests the social depth is no longer needed. You don't need the subject to render this politics. But equally, that's to me quite optimistic. That is to say, we too can work on kind of assemblage structure uh, that we offer a circuit of alternative desire that doesn't really always resonate. We don't need mass institutions. We're never going to have those again. I don't know if I believe what I'm saying, but I just want to see. No, I think that would be a nightmare. That's a situation that is geared towards to benefit uh, grifters and manipulators um, and reactionaries and ultimately genocidal fascists. Um, I think um, in terms of the sort of um, the prom promiscuity of nationalism that you're describing today, I think that is correct. It gives it a certain flexibility and adaptability. Mm -hmm. However, I think one of the one of their problems is uh, that they're thriving on uh, what Aristotle would call thora, the, in the imminent process of decay yeah. in capitalism and sort of liberal civilization. Um, they are not thriving on the basis of any great depth of uh, reservoirs of um, uh, intellectual, ideological, or political conviction, yeah. right? Uh, they're thriving on reservoirs of passion, of, of emotion for sure, um, which they have learned how to leverage, and they have um, learned how to use the techniques of micro-celebrity and so on to parlay these emotions in directions that they want. Mm -hmm. But this does, and, you know, like, I mean, it enables them to um, sort of navigate. So, for example, what, what, what are they saying now in America? The far right is for crypto. Like four years ago, they worked for crypto, yeah. neither for crypto. Um, 
And whether are they for the TikTok ban? We don't know. I, I think they probably are, but maybe they'll come out against it. They just need a bit of flexibility on this front. Um, but if they faced a real organized uh, alternative of any scale, um, and I'm talking about even uh, if it was not, uh, you know, especially leftist, you know, some kind of recalcitrant uh, social democratic formation might even be enough to do the trick. Um, though I don't think, I think that's what we're not going to see again because of climate change and what, what that will do to prices and um, uh, supplies, supply chains and so on. But um, even if they had anything like that kind of opposition, in other words, if there was anything at all that they could reasonably uh, call um, a leftist, let alone communist threat, mm. um, they would be considerably weaker than they are. Um, because the processes that are currently uh, parlaying as uh, the uh, sort of degeneration and decadence of uh, late capitalism, liberal civilization, etc., um, would have an alternative expression as the development um, and, let's say, um, the nucleus of something of an alternative way of living. That would be, you know, um, that would make things somewhat harder for them. So um, I also think that uh, when we talk about um, uh, the, the, the power of networks, we should, we should look at what the research shows us. Um, so there's um, some uh, research from the United States, uh, Jen Schrader, um, who's a, a, an academic at North Carolina, um, and she uh, looked at how people organized on Twitter, other platforms, and so on, and how, uh, particularly how the conservatives managed to uh, gain such an edge, and basically discovered, uh, you know, hardly uh, amazingly, that it favors those who have top-down hierarchical organization, who have funds, who have uh, leaders, uh, st structures of leadership and accountability, and who can say, right, I want you to set up an office of hate and I want that office of hate to be populated by people who are committed to this, this, and this. And I want you to recruit uh, volunteers online to encourage, uh, to stimulate swarms, okay? Um, now, we could do something like that, but I don't think that's quite the way in which we want to do politics. Um, so I think, um, and also I think it keeps people in a state of relative weakness um, and uh, disarticulation atomization is the you know classical mm -hmm. term um, and fundamentally finally you know fascism is a real threat it's a real danger um, it's uh, you know it's we're, we're not there yet mm -hmm. you know because if we were there uh, you know I'd be saying Trump's coming to power let's you need the guns mm -hmm. you know like you need to fight physically because you're in danger of your very existence um, I don't think we're there but fascism is not what holds power you know, um, and to me, um, th what, what holds real power is, you know, obviously for, for decades um, uh, we have been focused on, you know, like fossil fuels, big corporations like that. Um, recent book by Jeremy Gilbert um, and his colleague, I forget, um, Alex Williams, um, which basically argues uh, that uh, during this time, Silicon Valley has been building up in, in coalescence with finance and the rest of it. Uh, it's hegemonic power. It's, uh, you know, basically it has changed our lives so much in fundamental, structural, fundamental ways that we can't do without it. We're dependent on it. Mm. And, uh, you know, we are uh, basically um, enshackled to its political power. Okay, that's one form of power. But I think increasingly we are moving towards a kind of post-hegemony. And I know that this sort of thing has been announced before and people say, oh, hegemony's over, we don't know, no longer need to read Gramsci. Not quite what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that increasingly we notice that those who are in power, who aren't fascists, are increasingly insulated from, indifferent to, or actually contemptuous of, popular will. Um, and they are shameless. Now, this is a really important point. You know, we talk about the economy of passions. Um, any society where you've got structures of shamelessness, uh, where there isn't the shaming gaze, mm. 
uh, like you have that in fascism, where you can get away with doing certain things. You have it in slavery. Uh, you have that in authoritarian societies. When that starts to appear, uh, where the ruling class and the, 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 the people who run things don't give a shit what you think about anything, um, and they've stopped even bothering to lie to you, let alone try to mold your soul. You know, this is not like uh, Thatcher, you know, let's try and uh, change the, the, the soul by means of the economy. It's not like that anymore. Um, I'm just observing what we've been through over the last uh, nine, ten months with Gaza. And the um, inane, insultingly vacuous, relentless lies coming from the Biden White House coming from uh, their d disgusting spokespersons. John Kirby is the worst of them, I think. But they're all pretty um, repulsive creatures. Um, uh, and of course, you know, like uh, the state of Israel, do they give a fuck anymore? Like, they've given up on uh, the institutions of international law, right? Israel's supposed to uh, value its position as a legal entity. The whole point is Israel's supposed to be a state. And uh, it's, it's, you know, like basically, therefore, it takes very seriously its membership of international legal organizations. The United States historically would have said, well, you know, I mean, we would have said as leftists, they run the world, that is the nature of their hegemony, through the apparatuses of law and market. They stop giving a shit about the law. They've ignored the law. They've, they've said, oh, well, you know, we have a different reading. What's your different reading? Oh, eh, we don't know. Um, so they've given up the mechanisms of hegemony, or rather they've, so they've treated them with such uh, promiscuous contempt that ultimately th there's no more, um, you know, uh, there's no longer any uh, weight in them. So um, I would say that, um, uh, and, and you know, to, uh, just take one last example. Like, did you watch the last election, right? Um, you had... A part, a, a, an election fought on no issues whatsoever, no real issues, you know, Rwanda, but actually everybody knows that that is, it's a horrible policy, but it's designed as theater. It's designed not to happen. It's designed to get people excited and then to frustrate them. I think they thrive on this. That's why they keep promising the earth in terms of, you know, well, we're going to cut immigration numbers no more than 100,000 a year. They can't do it because they're committed to business. They will never do it. Like a fascist party would, but possibly. Um, even that's not guaranteed, but they can't. But they promise it, people get invested in it, then they feel let down. And as long as that's the center of their attention, they love that. Okay, so we had an election about theatrical issues, and we had a, a, a party coming to power on a manifesto that basically said nothing. Like, I'm not joking or, you know, exaggerating. It was an extraordinarily vacuous, vapid manifesto in historical standards, even compared to New Labour, you know. It's not like that. New Labour convinced large sectors of the public of its basic ideas. Nothing like that happened here. They win 36% of the vote. They get 66% uh, of the seats. Um, and now they're, on, you know, on cloud nine. They don't give a fuck. They don't have to worry about us anymore. Now they're cutting winter fuel allowances is the first thing they do. Just because, um, you know, kicking pensioners. I'm, I'm just saying that there seems to be a general pattern, uh, I think, in, 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 induced by the neoliberal reformation, um, and I think now radicalized in the sort of post-neoliberal kind of nation-statist uh, moment, uh, where um, the, there's a, a sort of an entrenched authoritarianism that is beyond hegemony, and it's beyond the usual mechanisms of hegemony, which is to do with, um, you know, truth um, and, and reasoning with you and persuading you. Thank you, Richard. I'm aware that we have well over eight, and you guys have sweltering heat, and you've suffered an awful lot. I don't know how hot you are, but ought, we should really ought to hear from you guys. So if there are any questions. Uh, hi, thanks a lot. Um, you parked the question of what the material is or what materialism is um, and didn't come back to it so I wanted to give you a chance to do that and I guess I also wanted just to elaborate a bit to invite you to sort of maybe either situate yourself or distinguish yourself from the I feel like you're, you're invoking Du Bois's idea of a psychological wage quite a lot um, or at least implicitly but as I'm, is, is that where you're going with some of these thoughts is, is it a bit different to that and then also sort of some, some of what you were saying seemed to reference the debate between Stuart Hall and people like Bob Jessup about Thatcherism, about whether or not it's 
you know, mostly an ideological project to force through an economic reform, or whether it did actually build a material, in, in inverted commas, hegemony. So if you could reflect on some of those questions, I'd be interested to hear. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, so that was a that was a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much. And um, it, it definitely um, made me think, because I came into this meeting thinking that, as I have about most um, political and, and social and economic and ecological problems, um, f felt that the great financial crisis of 2008 was uh, the the, um, the start of all that, really. Um, it was certainly was my political awakening. But when Richard was discussing the war on terror, see, I'm 40, so I grew up in the 2000s. And when you were referencing... Uh, the phenomena of the of the two thousands, the beginning, you know, the f normalization of Islamophobia, um, prevent torture, yeah. being normalized, etc. It actually made me rethink, um, and I'm going to try and formulate this into a question. But it made me rethink. Well, actually, maybe the war on terror um, is what lives on in our politics um, and economic and and. Uh, and our econ political economy rather than uh, the great financial crisis because if you listen to the, the far right um, I, and I would include Farage and, and others in that in that category they're never asked about their attitude to the great financial crisis they're not asked about what they would would have done about bankers that, that you know that's all been memory hold it seems whereas the legacy it's not even a legacy is it, it the the phenomena of the 2000s, the, the underlying uh, premises of the 2000s, war and terror, is still with us. And actually, um, it's, got a, it's got a hell of a lot worse. Um, just one final thing. Uh, you might have to rewrite your final chapter, Richard, because there was breaking news saying that um, far-right protesters have threw flares at Downing Street um, over Southport. So maybe um, Keir Starmer might be the first casualty of the fall of civilization to disaster nationalism. Um, thank you. I was really taken by the way you spoke about volunteering in your church as a sort of like antidote to some of the logic of capitalism. And I was kind of wondering the way, <laughs> like how the loss of public space or, you know, what some people term third spaces ties into your formulation of disaster nationalism, especially given that like so much of the culture um, of what you outline really seems to take place online. Is there a sort of like techno pessimistic strain to your argument, or how are you thinking about public space and the internet in relation to this? Just want to risk a word for optimism. I mean, not too much optimism because um, things obviously, in many ways, are very bad, um, and in general, a kind of collapse of the social fabric and millions of people waiting for hospital appointments and so on. But to be concrete, I mean, I was went last weekend on um, Trans Pride, which attracted 55,000 people. And it was extraordinary. I did not expect in a million years that there would be so many. And it's not just the numbers, but the fact that people were raising slogans around climate and were raising slogans around Gaza. And the same happened, incidentally, at Brighton Trans Pride the week before, is that when people were chanting free, free Palestine, lots of people joined in. And the, and the thing that interests me is that there is a constituency, there is a cohort, mostly of people under 30, who are not just, who do not just have views around one particular issue, but have a whole world view which incorporates um, trans liberation and Gaza and which also incorporates housing and climate and any number of things. Now, the challenge, which the left hasn't met, is what's the strategy? What is the way that you organize um, those people? But I think that there, there is certainly a constituency out there of large numbers of people who are not thinking. I mean, absolutely there is the way that Richard describes. I mean, in my slightly odd capacity as a Marxist who reads the Daily Telegraph, um, I, um, I did come with the question, why does Alistair Heath get such libidinal pleasure out of describing the end of the world? Which he does on a weekly basis. 
Um, so you've explained that, so that's cool. Um, but I do think that there, uh, that there is actually a constituency out there f um, for the left, and the question is, what do we do about it? Okay. So um, I'm going to cautiously agree with that. I think it's crucial to say that in this country, you know, we often have the idea of this country as particularly bad, raining fascism island, all of that. It's not really my experience. And actually, you know, the, the, you know, somebody asked about the volunteering. I mean, I volunteer to help refugees. And when I talk to the refugees, often they say, I have experienced no racism in this country, but when I was in Germany, I experienced terrifying racism. And I say, well, you, you just haven't got out of London much. I mean, <laughs> but actually, you know, if you look at the polls and all the rest of it, relatively speaking, um, and these things are all relative, um, it's, Britain's becoming quite a liberal society, socially liberal. Um, and I don't want to, you know, romanticize this because there are parts of this country that I despise with every black inch of my heart. Um, uh, particularly in <clears throat> North London. But um, the, um, the, the broad fabric of attitudes, um, you know, like, I mean, even taking this stuff about football, when I was, you know, growing up and becoming politicized, the idea I had of football was it was always vaguely threatening. You know, when the England flags were out, you knew something bad was going to happen. Some people were going to get beaten up, etc. And I know that still happens. I know that's still a thing. But I also see other energies, countervailing energies. And I, you know, I wish it didn't sort of, they didn't crystallize around fucking football, but um, that, you know, like I agree with you basically, there is something uh, building there. And it has been, it's a social process has been in the works. And I think frankly, we on the left have been slow. We've been negligent. Uh, you know, we've been too, too licking our wounds too much. We've internalized defeat. You know, all the all the guilt and shame around losing, around being beaten. We've just um, and and you know, when we should have been building something, uh, you know, it's always easy to talk about building. But when we should have been doing something other than riding every transient campaign, mm -hmm. we we weren't. Um, and I don't, you know, I, I use we, um, but actually I mean, you know, the, the people who could have had an influence on things. Um, I won't name names. Um, in terms of um, what you say, I'm going backwards in terms of the questions. In terms of what you say about the great financial crisis um, and uh, the war on terror, I think we have to be very careful here not to get caught up in the logic of a single causal pathway. Because I remember in the year before the war on terror start started, there were the riots in the northeast, or was northwest. it north, northwest? Yeah. And these were, um, yeah, I remember being corrected on that. Um, somebody, I, I gave a speech and I mentioned the riots in the northeast, and he said, if there'd been riots in the northeast, I would have heard about it, comrade. <laughs> um, no, but the race riots, um, I mean, race riots is an in, inaccurate term. Mm -hmm. There was fascist attacks and there was counterattacks, there was defense, and there was police violence. Mm -hmm. It was a complex process. Anyway. I remember that that emerged from uh, the molecular processes of, on the one hand, a kind of capital accumulation where um, essentially unionized workforces, which were multiracial and unionized, they've been organized, were destroyed, mm -hmm. where um, the post-industrial economy was carefully segregated. Uh, where you went into a particular type of occupation if you were of one ethnic background and another if you were from another ethnic background, where local councils dispersed resources on a segregated basis, where education was tacitly segregated, where the police treated young, uh, as they used to say, Asian men, as um, gangsters and as dangerous. Um, this is before it became all about Muslims. Uh, you know, that was a background theme at that point. And I remember that um, those riots um, gave the BNP their first breakthrough in the north. And they also um, instigated or, or formed the occasion for New Labour's strong pivot from a kind of, I don't know, uh, liberal multicultural cosmopolitanism, at least in, in spirit. There wasn't really much of that in the way of policy. You know, like, uh, we'll have the Lawrence Inquiry and we'll have devolution and we'll, rec we'll, we'll abolish Section 28 and all the rest of it. And then suddenly it's all like, no, you minorities have got to integrate with British values and we'll tell you what British values are as soon as you do it. Um, 
so, um, uh, and, and th so th this was already underway, in other words. There were molecular processes underway. Um, and just like in terms of what you say about Starmer being the first, possibly the first victim, like the centrists always are. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, th those are the people who um, enable it, uh, and then they're the first taken down. Right. In terms of, I, 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 w I wanted to try and answer this thing about public space and, and, you know, how that relates. I think it does relate in some way, and I think it has something to do with the fact that, um, you know, Naomi Klein used to describe this process of the um, destruction and branding of public space and so on. I think that's a real problem for us. Mm. And I think it's a real problem for anybody trying to do anything communal in spirit. And I think that does create uh, the kind of, um, you know, uh, basically it's not a coincidence that the social industry, Twitter, Facebook, and all the rest of it, as well as, you know, like uh, TaskRabbit and all those other things, emerge in a moment uh, of austerity when libraries are being closed, uh, when, you know, like public goods are being destroyed. Um, and where basically the internet suddenly said, ah, but you can have everything for free. You can just download it. Mm. You can download everything for free. And actually, do you know what? If you need money, you can uh, rent out your spare bedroom. Yeah. Or if you need a bit of cash, you can, you know, you use your car to drive people around. Make some money. Or go and fix somebody's sink. Great job. You know, like um, entrepreneurial subjectivity. Mm. That was their answer. And of course, that squeezes out uh, the kind of communal solidaristic responses. Um, and uh, it, you know, it, it, it creates, I, I really think this idea that Garris had, notwithstanding where he went politically, but the idea of the contract of mutual indifference as foundational to late capitalism, I think that uh, it becomes more productive by the day. So that's all I can say about that. Um, and then finally, uh, I'm asked about what materialism, what am I talking about, psychological wage, whole Jessup on Thatcherism. So in reverse order. Uh, yes, I agree, I am to some extent adverting to some of those debates. However, I'm trying to sell a book, so I deliberately don't mention it. Um, and it's not in the book, but yes, I'm sh formed by that. And uh, generally speaking, I have a lot of sympathy for Hall's argument yeah. that uh, cultural processes are uh, not merely derivative. You know, um, Judith Butler wrote a famous essay, you know, mere cult merely cultural. Yeah. Uh, and this is her attack on the idea of like, well, sexuality is just like, you know, you being queer or whatever is, is like merely cultural. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, when we talk about materialism, which I will come back to in a moment, um, it's as material as it gets, you know. It's, it's part of your sensuous existence. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of the, your well-being. And I really think the left has historically underestimated sexuality, which is why I put it right at the center of disaster nationalism, um, and not just to be dirty. Um, <laughs> Yes, I'm referencing the psychological wage, but to be honest with you, it's overdone. Mm. Everybody goes on about the psychological wage. I'm trying to concretize it as much as I can, and hence my recourse to, you know, like Lacanian psychoanalysis and uh, passions theory and all the other stuff, um, which is, you know, you don't have to accept those theoretical idioms in order to get something out of it because it's just to enable a t type of explanation to happen. So, yeah, uh, that's there. Okay, finally, materialism, right? <laughs> What bothers me um, is that um, we frequently, w look, I've heard transphobes use materialism to refer to their account of the body and sexuality. Mm. I've heard people use materialism to justify uh, the idea of a reductionist, uh, bread, and, bread and butter politics, blah, 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 uh, gas and water socialism, I think it used to be called. I've heard materialism um, used to um, refer to all manner of things in the same way that, like, somebody who's just been, um, uh, you know, first read Lacan in, in university suddenly starts talking about desire. Everything's about desire, 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 desire. And it's a frantically overdetermined term. Mm. What does it mean? Um, I think Marx's dialectic, if you really want to take it seriously, all this, uh, you know, like it starts with, um, you know, the, the idea of social labor, the value form, and then it's a dialectic of unfolding categories. It is not a physicalist materialism of the kind that we're familiar with. It is not materialism of the kind that Dawkins uses. It is not materialism of the kind that is commonplace in bourgeois culture. It is actually constantly insisting that there are immaterial causes in the world. And actually, if you look at it, the basis of its materialism is Aristotelian naturalism. Aristotelian naturalism 
uh, and the whole apparatus is four causes, material, efficient, final, informal, and so on. And the whole dialectic of forms, essences, um, and imminent laws, and so on, is based upon matter itself. You know, Aristotle, what does he say? He says, matter itself is nothing. It's pure potentiality with our attributes. If you ever have matter by itself, which is something you never see in nature, then you don't have anything. But any, any actual substance is matter and form. What is form? It's something immaterial. It's the active principle. And this is what Marx goes on and on about. You know, when he's talking about, um, for example, labor as the, fire, uh, as the form giving fire of the system, um, or when he's talking about, you know, the um, sort of uh, uh, essence of the innermost secret of the system, he's not just talking about something material or physical. He's talking about something that is uh, part of an idealist. It's an idealist dialectic, and frankly, I think the coherence of Marxism as, a, as an analytic, as an heuristic, um, and as a political project fundamentally is idealist. I think it's materialism is local. That's why we call it historical materialism. Now, nobody agrees with that and, uh, you know, hasn't agreed with that since, you know, the turn to Engelsian positivism in the late 19th, early 20th century. But I think if you go back and look, that's what you'll find. Aristotle is everywhere in capital. It's in the Gr Grundrisse. It's in the early essays. That's the basis of uh, our so-called materialism. And I don't think we need to pretend that we subscribe to this horrific, horrific, vile image of the world, the universe, the cosmos, as a fundamentally dead place in which the only difference between life and death is the arrangement of dead particles and in which the only meaning that exists is something that is purely arbitrarily ascribed to things by human beings who happen to have evolved to have those for, for purely random, scarce reasons in which any appeal to freedom or whatever, uh, you know, universality, mm -hmm. justice and so on, will founder on the shoals of um, differential strife. Mm -hmm. um, I think we don't have to accept that vile, mechanistic, atomistic picture of the world. Hence, I'm not in that sense a materialist. Um, and whenever people talk about materialism, it often makes my teeth grind because what the fuck are you talking about? Um, that's not aimed at you specifically. <laughs> Uh, Are you done? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, we're just, it's 8.30 now, and I think we should, you've probably earned a pint or two. Uh, so we're going to be congregating in the pub. I know the public space question was slightly neglected, so I just want to segue that to the pub. Um, uh, because for me, nationalism at its worst, sorry, at its most uh, ur text moment is narcissism. It's narcissism collectivized. Uh, and public space and sociability is the antidote. I don't mean to say then we can go script its sociability. I live a public life. I don't write enough. Why? Because I'm just wandering and drifting to the city and the towns and the villages. Sociability is everything because why? In that very instance, you might forget yourself. I'm not talking about a Levinasian encounter with the other. But in that sociability, you might forget ourselves. Liberal capitalism is a continuous injunction to be aware of yourself. Our worst selves are when we are aware of ourselves. Yeah. Public space is absolutely vital, and we too are complicit in its collapse, because as much as we might say it's the privatization of, of, uh, of the public state and its forums, we too have become so hell-bent on the consumerist offer of narcissistic socialization. That is to say, we seek out and solicit space, hence North London, the warranted slur, that we solicit <laughs> We solicit spaces that are forged in our own image in so many iterations. And I've experienced this the worst since I moved to London, that I too can always draw from the precious dew of my recognition at every instance. And when sometimes when we settle for this contract, we might be left wing or we pseudo left wing or in, in free zone left wing. But when you drift to the Swindons of this world, it will look entirely reversed. And we're going to just collapse into a socialized private atom atomization, but in our collective image. And that is a death knell for anything progressive that could even hope to challenge the nationalist offer. All right, let's go to the pub.